Hi everyone, welcome to the Mummy Movie Podcast, where we are looking at the Mexican film La Mamia Mezteca, otherwise known as the Aztec Mummy from 1957. So, interestingly, this film was actually highly inspired by the Universal Mummy movies of the uh, the 30s and 40s. You know, the likes of uh, The Mummy 1932 with Boris Karloff, uh, The Mummy's Hand, The Mummy's Tomb, The Mummy's Curse, The Mummy's Ghost. I think that's all of them, actually. Um, yeah, all of those kind of films. Um, unsurprisingly, this is most notably The Mummy from 1932. However, the goal here was to use that film as inspiration, but to change uh, change it slightly to incorporate the Aztec culture rather than the, the Egyptian one. I'm not going to lie, I actually think that's a really cool idea, I quite like it. In fact, although not widely viewed, this film was, well, it was successful enough to start a new genre of sorts in Mexico that essentially went alongside the Universal Horror films as well as spawning two sequels to this film, labelled uh, The Curse of the Aztec Mummy and The Robot vs. the Aztec Mummy, which I will admit I'm especially excited to cover in the future, because honestly, like, that concept just sounds so stupid and and I love it. But it also inspired other films, you know, based on Universal, such as uh, they had El Vampiro, which was based on Dracula. So basically, this film essentially spawned a whole cluster of, of Universal-inspired Mexican horror films, and honestly, who doesn't love that? That's awesome. I love that. Anyway, (laughs) moving on. In terms of the format for this episode, we shall start by having a a look at the historical aspect of the film, using it as a jumping-off point to talk about the Aztec culture and archaeology, that kind of thing, and then I shall simply review the film. But before then, as usual, it is time for the dramatic intro. Right. You are a brilliant scientist who has discovered how to see into people's past lives using hypnosis. However, you are shunned for your ideas by the scientific community and find it hard to come across willing subjects for your research. As such, your fiancé steps forward and allows you to hypnotise her. In her dream, she goes back to a past life where she was a young virgin consummated to the Aztec god Tezcatlipoca. She had been born purely for the sake of dying for her god. During her story, she talks about a forbidden love and how her lover had been forced into madness as punishment and buried alive. In this state, he was to protect a sacred breastplate for all eternity. When your fiancé returns to this life, you realise how you can prove that your method works. You must follow your fiancé's words. You must find this sacred breastplate in order to prove the truth in your research. However, little do you realise that by taking this from the tomb, you shall bring about a terrible curse. You shall awaken the Aztec Mummy. Okay, so on to the historical accuracy section. As usual, I should probably just say I'm an Egyptologist. I'm not an expert on the Aztec culture. You know, in fairness, I have done a fair amount of research and I have tried to make uh, what I say as accurate as possible, but just please bear that in mind while you're listening to this. The main scene we are going to talk about here is the flashback scene. Essentially, at one part in the film, the main character, Dr. Eduardo, hypnotises his fiancée to take her back to her past life. We are then met with a scene set in the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan, where his fiancée's former self, who's called uh, Xochio, is a woman born to be consecrated to um, Tezcatlipoca. In this scene, it is specified that she must remain a virgin and was born with the sole purpose of dying. First things first, Sotio is indeed an Aztec name. It means flower and is strongly associated with the goddess Xochiquetzal. She was basically the uh, the goddess of art, passionate love, 
young female sexual power, flowers, and physical pleasure. Shotzi Quetzal uh, was depicted as forever young and could be identified with a floral headband containing emerald quetzal feathers. So, first things first, it probably should be specified that sacrifices in Aztec times normally happened at the, the various festivals throughout the year. So, and well, there were a few festivals where young women believed to be the uh, living manifestations of Sochi Quetzal. I, I swear that I'm probably pronouncing that name differently every single time. Apologies for that. But essentially, there were various festivals where um, a young women believed to be sort of like um, the living manifestation of uh, Sochi Quetzal would be sacrificed. One of these was uh, called the Festival of Toxical. Uh, this took place in May. This is probably the most likely one when we're talking about the film, largely because it was associated with Tezcatlipoca and, well, the film makes several references to, to that god. So, just for reference, uh, Tezcatlipoca was the god of many things, including the night sky, hurricanes, obsidian and conflict. It is hard to know exactly what the purpose of this festival was, but there seems to be elements of a, a celebration of a good harvest. On top of that, there was a tension here on a sacrifice to Tezcatlipoca as the lord of rulership. Though, probably should note, this was normally a young male youth, not, not a female. However, Shotzi Quetzal was also a large part of the festival as one of the... Uh, as one of um, Tezcatlipoca's four concubines. All of these gods and goddesses uh, would have had impersonators on Earth who would have basically kind of acted and been treated and revered as gods for a, a full year leading up to the festival. And when it comes to the impersonator of uh, Tezcatlipoca, the chosen young man was taught courtly speech, singing and to play the flute. Throughout the year, he would parade through the streets of Tenochtitlan, the capital of the Aztecs, and be treated with great reverence. He would also be wed to the four wives representing uh, Shotzi Quetzal and, and the other wives of uh, Tezcatlipoca, so you can kind of see the way on earth they're trying to imitate what they kind of thought was going on uh, between the gods as well. Then, a year later, we would finally arrive at the festival, the Festival of Toxtacle. For four days before the main ceremony, the youth representing Tezcatlipoca would seclude himself, awaiting his final moments on this earth. And then, on the fifth day, his four wives would accompany him to the stairs of the pyramid. As he walked, he would play a sad tune on a thin flute with a flower shape on one end, awaiting his inevitable fate. As they arrive at the pyramid, his wives would depart, and freely he would walk up the steps where he would arrive at a stone slab. He would be laid down on his back on this slab, as a large crowd watched from below. You can almost imagine the anticipation in the crowd. A priest would raise an obsidian knife above his head. Then, as the crowd watched, he would bring this knife down into the youth's chest. Finally, he would pull out the still beating heart and hold it up for all to see. Although this was the main sacrifice of the festival of Toxtical, there were also others. Most of these sacrifices were of men, usually captives of war. However, it does seem likely that the four women depicting the wives of Tezcatlipoca, including Sotzi Quetzal herself, would have also been sacrificed. And so, maybe, this is what the film is trying to depict. Albeit, admittedly, incredibly loosely. Another festival associated in part with Sotzi Quetzal is Huey Pachli in uh, the, the month of October, specifically between about the, the 12th and the 31st of October. This festival is also named Tepelhuitl. I really apologise if that said it incorrectly. Uh, I wasn't able to find a very good guide for this name, but essentially the meaning of it was, was essentially Mountain Feast. Its purpose, once again, is relatively obscure, though it seems to be linked with the approaching dry season. 
But then again, conversely, it's also been noticed by some academics that the rain did not actually stop until mid-November. Therefore, it is likely that the purpose of this festival was both to thank the gods of the rain such as Talalok, but also to perform rituals aimed at obtaining the indispensable rains and water for the, the growth of maize. In fact, during this festival, the priests dressed in robes that were painted and decorated with human hearts and hands, a sign that meant that with their hands and hearts they were asking for a good harvest. Shotzi Quetzal was celebrated at this festival largely because she was the concubine of Tlaloc, and well, just for reference, in the Aztec religion it was believed that Shotzi Quetzal was actually stolen from Tlaloc by um, Tezcatlipoca. You know, hence she's seen as kind of like both of their wives in, in various festivals. In the film, when we're seeing sort of her sacrifice, it's kind of hinted at that she was stabbed in the heart, and, and this is essentially how she dies. However, if the ritual was anything like that seen at um, the festival of uh, Pachtonli, um, celebrated slightly earlier in October on the 6th, then the sacrifice here may have actually been far more gruesome. In this festival, the woman who was representing Shotzi Quetzal wouldn't have just been stabbed in the heart. She would have been decapitated and her flesh would have been flayed. In this festival, there were actually two women acting as Shotzi Quetzal. Both of them would have been decapitated, their skin flayed, but then their flesh would have been worn by one of the male priests. The male priest would wear both the sacrifice skin and a costume of the goddess, and would imitate the tasks of weaving, which were seen as more feminine to the Aztecs. As he did, artisans in animal costumes would have danced, whilst displaying the tools of their particular crafts. On a more accurate note, the film also states that the sacrifice would have been a virgin. In the case of the festival of Pachtonli, this is actually correct, and, well, in fact, they would have even been of noble lineage. This might sound quite surprising, considering, well, they're, they're being sacrificed, but it is worth noting that, well, essentially, being sacrificed was one of the, the few ways you could actually make it to the afterlife. Most people didn't make it. So uh, the main ways where you could uh, be sacrificed, die in war, uh, sort of drown, be struck by lightning, or um, you, you could die in childbirth as well. So when you take that into account, I suppose it's not shocking that uh, maybe some more kind of like noble members of the society would be sacrificed as well. So when it comes to the film, on the plus side, there were several festivals where women representing Shotzi Quetzal would be killed. At least in the, the festival of Pachtonli, the woman portraying the goddess was supposed to remain a virgin. However, it is also worth noting that the film does not seem to uh, be depicting Pachtonli, and instead most of the evidence points towards Toxtical, like that, that, you know, that festival instead. In this festival, rather than being a virgin, the woman was actually supposed to be uh, consummated with the young man who was betraying uh, Tezcatlipoclí. This could suggest that, in this instance, the woman portraying the goddess was not a virgin, although I will admit I'm not 100% on that. On top of that, it does seem that the film is relatively tame when it comes to the actual sacrifice scene itself. Though admittedly, considering the woman should have been uh, beheaded and, and skinned, Maybe that's for the best. Okay, so time for the review. To begin with, I like that the film uh, basically just immediately starts. After a short part with, uh, with the narrator laughably trying to convince us that this is based on true events, the film immediately goes to a massive gunfight where we are basically introduced to the main bad guy. He is called the Bat, and he is essentially both a gangster and a scientist who is believed to be mismatching animals to make terrifying monsters. I'm not going to lie, this is pretty fun and colourful, though also it is weirdly noticeable that this does not come up again in the film, which is just bizarre. Like the fact that he's mismatching animals to make monsters just doesn't come into the film at all. He doesn't undertake any scientific experiments either, so... 
I guess I was just kind of like backstory. I will admit, like, I felt there was definitely more they could have done with the Bat character. And I definitely would have loved to have seen these monsters, but I'm, I'm going to be positive about this. I'm going to sort of like chalk this up to a strange positive as ultimately it is quite funny that they don't go into that side of the bat at all outside of you know a passing mention and at the same time it did set the the film off to a fast-paced start half good half the kind of like funny point i guess the the film puts a lot of emphasis into hypnosis and i will admit again uh normally i try to split these reviews into sort of like good funny bad sections but here, much like with, with the Bat's sort of like backstory, they're kind of all like merged into one. At the beginning of the film, the main character, Dr. Eduardo, is at a, he's basically at like a scientific conference where he is claiming that hypnosis can be used to bring people back to their past lives. Now look, I'm pretty sure if I went to a scientific conference, well actually, let's say I go to an Egyptology conference because that makes more sense for me personally, uh, and I started talking about sort of past lives and that kind of thing. I am relatively certain that I would not be taken seriously. So you'd think that in the film, maybe that will be the direction they should probably go as well. You know, the, the scientific community being more sceptical of this kind of research. That would make sense, right? But no. In this film instead, they just claim that his research is too dangerous to be carried on. And I'm sorry, but like, what? Like, what scientist is ever going to say that? And on top of that, uh, Eduardo claims that he can find no volunteers to undertake his experiment due to this danger. I'm sorry, but there are plenty of people out there who believe in past lives and want to find out more about them. It's not something I personally believe in, but, well, as an Egyptologist, I've definitely heard about, you know, people who think they are the reincarnation of Cleopatra. It's always Cleopatra. <laughs> I'm not sure why that is. Like, why does Hatshepsut never get her day? Why is it never like, I'm the reincarnation of Ramesses II? It's always Cleopatra. Going back to the film, when Eduardo finally finds someone to hypnotise, it's his own fiance, uh, Flor. I love that they basically just use an oversized wheel with some swirly lines to hypnotise her. You know, there's something very quaint about that, and I think it's quite adorable. And well, look, now, obviously, all of this is kind of like so bad that it's good, you know, in that kind of area of filming. However, by the same token, the use of hypnotism here does add a, you know, some surprisingly good elements as well. For a start, it is also undeniably colourful and entertaining. There's just no way around that. Like, I enjoyed it. On top of that, although they uh, still very much have the whole mummy falling in love with the love interest in the film angle, the hypnotism, you know, actually made that whole storyline run smoother than it normally does. Or, or at least I felt it did anyway. Ultimately, this is because the, the kind of like beginnings of this um, story is set in ancient times uh, through Floor's hypnotised state. You know, you see it as a flashback. And so it kind of leans into the idea of uh, sort of showing, not telling, or <laughs> in the case of many of the 1940s films, not even telling the story at all. But it essentially it shows that um, Floor is linked to the mummy because they used to have like an ancient love affair. Again, you know, this isn't necessarily original, but... I do think it did this part of the story better than most of the old universal horror films of which this film is heavily influenced by. Whilst hypnotised and talking about her kind of story, Flor mentions a sacred breastplate. When she comes to, Eduardo realises that he can prove that his idea works by finding this breastplate and, uh, you know, this would prove to the scientific community that his hypnotism idea essentially works. This, at least in, in the film's logic, does make some kind of sense. It gives them a, a reason for going to the pyramid at Tenochtitlan. It gives them a reason for breaking in and taking the cursed object that will, well, you know, ultimately lead to the, the mummy coming back to life in the first place. The mummy in this film, in my opinion at least, is actually incredibly creepy, which is very rare for these old films. Um, I think you occasionally get that a bit with the um, the Universal horror films, but it is quite rare. Normally they come across quite kind of goofy instead. This one I genuinely think that the mummy did look scary. His skin is like dried and cracked leather, and it's hard to tell whether this is actually supposed to be his, his like face or, an, or like a mask. Further, they do not do the thing that like so many horror films always feel inclined to do, 
Um, at no point in this film do you clearly see the mummy, largely because they use the darkness to effectively conceal it. As such, even in such a sort of like so bad it's good silly film like this, as well it ultimately is, it is easy to let your imagination fill in the blanks of what you are you are looking at, conjuring up terrifying images that really aren't possible to put on screen in the first place. Now, I know I've essentially covered a lot of things that are sort of already in the uh, funny side of things. However, there are some parts of this film that are just funny without any kind of like legitimate positives. Not necessarily a negative either, but just kind of, they're just kind of there if you like. So, um, for instance, the use of music in this film is very shaky to say the least. Whenever you see the bat, so like the villain, the villain in the film, you get the dramatic music, you know, loud and sort of like boisterous, if you will. But then whenever it cuts away from him, the music just abruptly stops and the film just, you know, continues. It's incredibly awkward and it reminds me a lot of the very old horror films from like the 1930s. You know, um, Bela Lugosi's Dracula, The Ghoul, that kind of thing. Because I did find with those old films... It did take them a little bit of a little bit of time to figure out how to actually use the music properly, you know, as they're kind of entering the uh, the talky era of film. Another thing in this film, and I will say this one, yes, it is a funny point, but I, I think it also falls into the bad section as well, if I'm perfectly honest. As we get to the end of the film, it feels like the writers were starting to just kind of freak out because well they include every cliche in the book and they do so without it really needing to be there so for instance early on we have eduardo using hypnosis to take his fiance back to her past life to prove that this has worked he goes and finds an ancient artifact that she talks about in her trance and in doing so awakens an evil mummy this is a, a fun little plot not the most unique maybe but perfectly serviceable I'd say that's a fine little film. However, at the end of the film, we then have the mummy falling in love with Floor, the fiancé, and, and kidnapping her. I mean, yeah, sure, I suppose. We have established earlier on that um, they were in love in a past life, so I can give the film a pass for that, I guess. However, then we find out that the breastplate um, has hieroglyphs that lead to ancient treasure, and, and this, this plot just sort of comes out of nowhere. Like, it really wasn't necessary to be there in the first place. We already had a motivation for him finding the breastplate. The only reason I can think for this plot device being here is so that they could include the bat character in the film. But ultimately, the bat's part here doesn't make any sense anyway. We've already established that he is an evil gangster scientist who mixes animals together to make monsters, which, as I said earlier, is never mentioned again in the entire film, which is insane to be perfectly honest in terms of the film all he does is randomly show up to find the breastplate because he wants to find the treasure but the thing is the only reason he knows about the treasure is because eduardo and floor find the breastplate so why was he originally watching eduardo by this film's logic the bat knew about eduardo's research into hypnosis and you know and past lives and he knew that he was going to perform this on his fiance, even though that was not the original plan. On top of that, somehow, he would have to know that Floor's past self was around um, in Aztec times and knew the location of the breastplate. Even if we, you know, take all of these massive plot holes for granted, then he also knew that Eduardo would come to the conclusion that he had to find the breastplate. I mean, are you confused yet? Because, well... I really don't blame you. It doesn't make any sense at all, and it just kind of takes you around in circles. Essentially, all of this means that, well, as the film gets to the end, it felt like the writers were just launching heaps of spaghetti at a wall, hoping that something stuck. But what's really annoying is that, well, like I said earlier, they already had spaghetti sticking to the wall. They had a perfectly fine film until they started messing around with it far too much just remove the bat character from the film and it would have all been you know admittedly a little cliched and generic but ultimately fine and even when they catch the bat and do the big reveal at the end you know as to who he is they make a big deal out of this but 
I have no idea who this person actually was. I'm going to guess he was a character we saw once earlier on in the film. My guess was he's one of the scientists in the actual kind of like um, conference at the beginning. But they definitely weren't like a big part of the film and they weren't made to be memorable in any way. Plus, even if they are a scientist and they knew about Eduardo's uh, research, okay, that explains why they might be following him, but it doesn't explain all of the other mountains of plot holes. Okay, right. Another point here, and in my opinion, this might be the worst part. Yeah, I think this might be the worst part of the film. For the most part, the music in this film was absolutely excruciating. It's fair to say that, well, this is partly because it's an old film and it has become a bit, you know, wavery with time. You can't blame the film for that. But by the same token, even taking that into account, it is absolutely terrible. Like the very opening of the film is horribly out of key. And then during the flashback scene, there is a woman who's like singing and, and this legitimately made me turn the volume of my TV down. I know people are going to think I'm exaggerating here, but I I'm really not. By far, this is the worst music I have ever heard in a film. And okay, you could argue this is a horror film and maybe the music is off key deliberately to make it kind of like unsettling. But ultimately, I don't think it was unsettling. I just think it was bad. I think if that was their attempt, they failed. It made me uncomfortable in a bad way. It made my ears bleed. <laughs> <laughs> the final thing I want to mention about this film is, well, just how dark it was, especially in the second half. And don't get me wrong, this worked well in keeping the mummy hidden, which did genuinely make it into quite a scary villain in many ways. But also, in order to have any chance of watching the second half of the film, I had to close all of the curtains in my room and turn the brightness of my TV all of the way up. Even then, I could only see about 20% of what was going on. Again, I know people will think I'm exaggerating here, but honestly, I'm not. I've actually put a link to this film in the episode description, so go and check it out for yourself if you don't believe me. The second half, especially the last scene, is ridiculously dark. Like, even when it comes to the killing of the mummy at the end, I only, I'm only about like 50% sure I know how they did it. I think what they did was hold a crucifix up to it because, well, I guess they got confused between mummies and vampires. As, well, I have noticed they, they seem to have a habit of doing in some of these old Aztec films. I'm looking at you, uh, wrestling women versus the Aztec mummy. <laughs> but I'm honestly not entirely sure. So overall, well, look, how would I rate this film? There is no denying that this is in the so bad it's good category. Therefore, by my own ranking system, it's capped at a, you know, it can only really get up to 6 out of 10 in total. But by the same token, even if it's a bad rating, it's kind of in a fun way. In fairness, I genuinely enjoyed the first 45 minutes of this film. Overall, the hypnotism part of it, you know, made me smile. And although there were plot holes aplenty, the idea of Eduardo having to find the breastplate to prove his theory and, you know, to pass lives did make some kind of sense, uh, at least by the film's logic. There were also some kind of like unintentionally bad parts uh, that also came off as oddly funny and charming. So, you know, you, they can be forgiven for them. For instance, how the music just randomly stopped whenever going away from like the Bat character. Or to a degree at least, how the writers seemed to have freaked out as they got to the second half of the film and just threw every unnecessary cliche in the book into it. But also, there were some truly awful things here, such as the excruciating music and, and just how dark everything was. It's a shame, really, because there is the basis of a good film here. You know, not an amazing one, but a good film, a solid film. But they messed it up in, a, in, a, in an annoying way. Overall, I would give this film a 4 out of 10. There is still some silly enjoyment to be had here, but it is weighed down by one too many negatives. Thank you very much for listening. I certainly hope you enjoyed this episode. If you have, well, you know the drill. Please do like, subscribe, leave a comment. 
hire a plane and do sky writing for the mummy movie podcast um just before sort of we finish properly i should probably say um i have to edit my my schedule a little bit for the uh, foreseeable future ultimately it's a bit ironic but uh the podcast has sort of grown a little bit started make a little bit more money for you through sort of various revenues that kind of thing but ironically it means that there's a lot more work to do around the edges and things like that as such um for the time being at least i'm gonna have to drop down to doing an episode sort of every other week as opposed to every week i i feel like i'm gonna be sort of sacrificing quality if i if i you know keep up the current schedule uh really sorry for anyone who's disappointed by that but i do think it is for the best if you are wanting to keep sort of a weekly thing i hate to be the person to plug my patreon <laughs> but i i'm doing a few sort of patreon exclusive episodes at the moment for the the paid tier at the moment these are mainly looking into the life of howard carter so the man who found the tomb of tutankhamun kind of biographies i suppose and i'm also looking into doing just a few kind of factual episodes as well that kind of thing I do also release Patreon sort of exclusive episodes on the free tier as well. These are mainly just uh, non-Egyptology based film reviews. So, you know, generally just silly little reviews, really. I've done one for Batman and Robin and another for Back to the Future. Kind of thinking of doing all of the Back to the Future films, to be honest, because quite frankly, who doesn't want an excuse to watch those films? <laughs> However, if you're not interested in any of that, you know, in particular, that's absolutely fine, of course, uh, in that case. I shall see you in two weeks' time, where we shall be looking at the Mummy Resurrection from 2022. I hope you all have a brilliant next couple of weeks, and see you then.